Hello, it's Josh Lewis. It's October 20th, doing another interview for the DC Gardeners Oral History Project, which is sponsored by the Neighborhood Farm Initiative and the DC Humanities Council. Today I'm with Mr. Ava Licorice. Um, we're at his house in Washington, DC. And so thank you, Abel, for allowing me to come over today. And could you start by just saying your name and address for folks? Yes, this is Abel Licorice. I'm at 61 Allison Street, Northeast Washington, D.C., 20011. Thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, where did you grow up? I'm an island boy. Uh, I grew up in the islands, Caribbean island, Grenada, to be specific. Island of Spice, you know. <laughs> that's, that's, okay. That's a... Uh, and so Grenada, most people listening to this might not have been to Grenada. What what uh what do you what's what's it like? I mean, what are some of the, the well, Grenada is pretty much laid back, uh, mm. small country, beautiful beaches, and it's a it's a nice area to to grow up. Mm -hmm. uh, family oriented, people know each other. You know, mm -hmm. everybody knows everyone in the village. You know. Yeah. So it's pretty much uh, family style. Growing up there, so uh, in Grenada, I mean, this is a tropical environment. You're probably surrounded by a lot of uh, you know wild fruit and very like tropical. A uh, mm -hmm. lot of fruits, lots of a lot of fruits, abundance of fruits. Name uh, some of them. Uh, well, we have the bananas there. That's what we we use this as a uh, as part of the industry there. Mm -hmm. We export it to uh, Europe, maybe to the United States. I'm not sure where the market is. But uh, <clears throat> we have the coconuts, we have the breadfruit, we have uh, soursop, we have papaya, guava, you name it, it's all tropical. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, in the town or village or city, was I mean, what did you grow up in, a big city? Or? I, I grew up in a little, uh, in the countryside, mm -hmm. uh, in a little, in a, on a, pa well, we have several parishes on that island. So, um, we have six par uh, seven parishes, so I'm in St. Andrew's Parish, cool. and that's the agricultural region of the island. Cool. Mm -hmm. So, the agricultural region, so it's, I mean, it's, you must have been involved in some level uh, growing up with growing food. I mean, did you guys have yeah. a garden, or did yeah. you have that? Yeah, my dad was a, uh, uh, my dad, his, his job, well, he was an agriculturist. Mm. Uh, for many many years, since he was eighteen, he uh, he was uh, working for the government of Grenada as an agriculturist, and he uh, acquired a lot of lands on his own. So uh, as young boys, he used us to work the land, and you know, so um, apart from him having a good job as an agriculturist, he brought his techniques over to his farm, to his fields, and uh, he did very well. What does that mean, agriculture? Well, like, what type of stuff specifically did he do? Well, um, we have. Uh, he was in charge of, like, say, a nursery, where we will uh, um, we will get plants, uh, seedlings, or whether it's seedlings, or whether it's a uh, uh, grafting of plants, whether it's um, um, cloning of plants. He was in charge of that area. To make sure that the uh, workers did the work properly. Okay. So did you go? I mean, did you ever go and see his work and what he was doing? Yes, yes. Uh, apart from that, uh, that um, propagation they call it. He was in charge of um, growing things in the fields, mm -hmm. um, sweet potatoes, whatever the short crop might be, cabbage, field crops. Mm -hmm. You know. And uh, yes, I will go. Uh, he will invite us to go with him. Mm -hmm. Uh, just to see what he is, what he was doing at all times. And so, as a kid, I mean, was this something that you you did because you were interested in it? Was it really interesting, or was it just kind of something that you know was around? And well, the thing is, uh, there's not much to do on this island. Uh, is it that you, is it that you work for the government? You do agriculture, or what else? Uh, very few things to do. Mm -hmm. Agriculture is very key. Almost everybody will do some kind of a, some form of agriculture, mm -hmm. whether it's in the backyard or somewhere. Mm -hmm. So as a kid, uh, after school, uh, because he had this property, he kept us at home and we had to help him out. Mm -hmm. Raise the animals, feed the animals, everything like that, and 
grow the crops, yeah. harvest the crops, you know, stuff like cocoa, mm. chocolate. Wow. We had fields of it, acres of it. Wow. So um, when harvest time, to harvest the cocoa is a big job. <clears throat> How do you harvest cocoa? Well, cocoa, it grows in this big old tree, wooded tree. Mm -hmm. It, a tree could get as large as a, um, a oak tree, a young oak tree, mm. and uh, the cocoa um, gives out these flowers on the trunk of the plant, or on the hard branches. I guess there are little nodules there, mm. and it sends out this, the flowers, and it, and then somehow it gets pollinated. I'm not quite sure if it's by insect. I don't know how this cocoa become pollinated. Mm. But it is pollinated. Maybe the ants, I think, has a play because the cocoa plants, or trees, have a lot of ants, and I think the ants are key in pollination. There. But anyways, um, uh, the, the the flowers comes out in clusters, and almost every flower will produce a cocoa pod, and then it will grow, and then become mature and then inside of that part is the beans so um, after it ripens it has to be ripened before you harvest after it ripens then we have to go into the field with uh, what we call a cocoa knife <laughs> because it sits on a long stick or bamboo mm -hmm. which we usually use and we attach a knife with a claw with a a hook mm -hmm. and we use that to harvest the cocoa. The lower cocoa on the lower part of the plant we can cut it off with a machete or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, for um, my dad he had well over uh, 30 acres of land and a lot of them, a lot of the land was cultivated with cocoa and banana. So we had to go on harvest time we had to individually pick the cocoa off the, the tree mm. one by one. That's the only way you could harvest cocoa. Isn't it kind of dangerous to harvest bananas? Aren't there some like crazy spiders and stuff? And well, stuff? yes, but uh, like anything else, you get used to it, you know? <laughs> because, uh, look, serpents live in the banana inside of the but in the bunch of the banana. Mm -hmm. Uh, serpents will climb up in there and, and live in there, mm. uh, make nests in there. And when you harvest a bunch of banana, here goes the supper. You, you just have to get it out and keep it moving. You know, <laughs> it's something you get used to. Yeah. yeah. Like <laughs> because they're not poisonous to begin with. So, okay. Yeah. It just hurts. It just scares. <laughs> you see this big thing coming out of it. Sometimes they will they will run at you. They will jump at you. You know, it all depends on what type of they they will actually leap and then they were scared yeah. yeah so um what was the rest of your community like i mean in terms of you guys grew a lot of stuff but i mean where did you go for other vegetables and stuff that you needed were there like markets or supermarkets yeah we have a market uh, uh you could call it a community market but um we seldom go to that market but we produce enough stuff that we were sort of, sort of self-contained by mm. my, my family. Wow. Yeah, my my dad will get it. if he if we don't have it in our garden or our farm, my dad gets it. He has access to get it at the uh, agriculture department oh, okay. because um, he supervises everything there from um, the growing of the the stuff to the harvesting to the marketing mm. and everything. Okay. So uh, we always had. We always had food, um, vegetables, and meat. Yeah. Uh, different types of meat: mm -hmm. poultry, beef, lamb. As a matter of fact, uh, my sister belongs to the. Well, when we were growing up, she had. Uh, she was a member of the 4-H club back home, and then somehow the 4-H club here in D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, in New Jersey, sorry, uh, linked up, and they, they gave her. Uh, uh, one of those milking cow cows, I think it's called a Jersey cow, mm. but it, it's a milk producing cow. Mm -hmm. And they gave it to her as some sort of a prize she had won. And my so dad. Um, you shipped it there? Yeah, they shipped it over there. They shipped it to One cow? One cow, <laughs> a female. Okay. And uh, my dad had a huge bull, or a stud bull, 
and he um, you know um, crossed it over and crossed the breed but it, the, the female because she's because in her genes in her DNA she's said to be a milking animal mm -hmm. she's produced lots of good milk mm -hmm. by crossing you know, all it did was to produce a super hybrid animal because the stud bull was a big old bull big old thing <laughs> I think it, it weighed about maybe a ton wow big old thing that thing was big but um so like I said we always had stuff and that make sure that we had food as a matter of fact um the crops that we harvested like the cocoa and the bananas nutmeg all the mm. spices we uh that well we ship that out because we have a, a what do we call a cooperative mm -hmm. where we will sell our produce to the local cooperative and then they will um process it mm -hmm. and then ship, ship it out, out. Mm -hmm. and uh we made a good a lot of uh we made a good living out of that mm -hmm. because in those days uh there was a, a big demand for it the demand was high yeah and uh, the way it works, the cooperative will pay you a certain percentage up front mm -hmm. when you sell your produce. And then they'll keep some of the money back, and, but they'll keep track of it. And uh, at Christmas time, <laughs> you get what we call a yeah. back pay. And people go shopping and, and buy all the goodies and stuff. Yeah. So uh, that was some kind of incentive. It's just like tax return. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, he made a lot of money out of that because, uh, for example, the average shipment of cocoa, because we we had our own pro um, processing. Well, there are many processes to cocoa, but you have to first of all ferment the cocoa mm -hmm. and dry it. F ferment the beans. Mm -hmm. Because when they're fresh, they're nice and juicy. We even used to eat those things in the field. Not eat them, but suck the juice out of them. Mm -hmm. Nice and sweet, with a little acid, acid taste mm -hmm. to it. Nice. <laughs> and when you get a real succulent cocoa pod, a cocoa, man, it's like having a meal, man. It was that good. Wow. But first you have to ferment the cocoa to get the color. It's a brown color that you're looking for, a nice brown color. Mm. Once you get that brown color, it takes 21 days, and that way you have to rotate the cocoa from one bin to another to to get the, those on the bottom to come on top to get the color. Mm. And you do it with, within 21 days, and you get a nice brown color. Mm. I guess the acid and the juice and all that cause the fermentation. You know? Yeah. Isn't yeah. That right. Then after that's done, then you ha we have what we call um, trays on wheels big trays mm -hmm. and we put the cocoa in there and the sun dries it out yeah. we, we use the sun for drying mm -hmm. and then that's one way of selling the cocoa the other way is to just when you when you harvest it and you remove the beans you can sell it to a local depot fresh mm -hmm. but for a lower price mm -hmm. and they process it but then they get a higher price for the drive. Yeah. Right, right, see? Well, they put it in more of the. Right. Yeah. Right. Um. So what? Like, what is it like for like a planting season? I mean, can you plant? I mean, is it really that? Cocoa? Well, I mean, in terms of most things, you know what I mean. Like here is, you know, it's kind of strict. Like you know, you got to uh -huh. make sure you get this in by this. Day. Right. 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 I mean, how how much? Oh no! Uh, there is no um, there is no limit there. There is no um, restraint. There is no um. Nothing to bother us because it's warm all year round. Just plant whenever you feel like. Whenever you feel, but uh, <laughs> sometimes you can't plant. Everything. <laughs> Not everything you can plant when you feel because some of the plants uh, will only um, produce at certain times of the year. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, we call it sorrel, but it's a hibiscus family. Mm -hmm. It will only produce. Well, now maybe they have hybrids now that will produce other time, but most time they will only produce. In December mm -hmm. and January, okay. uh, something about that plant, um, and then um, another thing about Grenada, we have two seasons there: the wet and the dry season. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the dry season, uh, if you don't have access to water, you better forget it. Mm -hmm. uh, the wet season could be a problem because you get torrential rain and too much rain; mm -hmm. you can't do much. But um, somehow you have to plan between 
sometime when the dry season is almost ready to finish and then the wet season coming on so somewhere between April and July is about the best time to plant okay mm -hmm. cool so uh, I mean how long how long were you there I mean did you well I was born and raised there so um, I left home when I was uh, 17 years old right up right out of high school okay and I, I came here to further my education and uh, I took um, uh, business administration. I went to a school down downtown called the Smith Business School. So you came, you came straight to DC. Straight to DC, and straight to that school. <laughs> <laughs> I enrolled. Uh, I got enrolled back home, and I, uh, I had to come straight to that school yeah. to further my education. And um, I didn't really have. I, I, Honest to goodness, I had no idea what Washington D.C. was mm. uh, looked like. I had no idea, no clue. Yeah. My sister lived here oh. prior to me coming, but uh, I had no idea what I was getting into. Yeah. All I knew, I was coming to go to school. That's all I knew. So, I mean, what was what was some of the? I mean, had you even been anywhere internationally before? No. Okay. The only place that uh, well. Uh, well, locally, I mean, in the region to Barbados, mm -hmm. I've been there. Yeah. But that's the only place I've traveled to at, at a young age of 17. Wow. Uh, well, uh, like, you know, we didn't have any uh, reason to go anywhere because my dad had us under mm -hmm. such strict rules and all that, and we can even play with the neighbors. <laughs> 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 so, I mean, when you got here, I mean, I can, I, I would imagine that the the pace of the culture in the islands is a little slower than it is fast paced in Washington D.C. I mean, what was it like even just when you hit the airport? You know, was it people what? just bustling <laughs> by you? And you just turn. Well, Josh, you know, um, I don't think I even had time to even figure out figure that out. My mind was still in a youthful age, mm -hmm. and I couldn't figure out um, whether I had missed something back home and come into a new area. Whether uh, I, I couldn't find a difference really. Mm -hmm. I, I stepped into a new area at a young age, and I just fell into it. Mm -hmm. I didn't really have, I didn't stop to think about. Uh, I'm even uh, a slow pace of life back home. Mm -hmm. Coming to uh, at that age, I wasn't thinking like that. I just jumped right in. Yeah, so you, I mean, you must have been pretty anxious. Kind of, yeah. Well, once I once I got here and I saw what was going on, I just yeah. fit right in. Yeah. I didn't have any kind of a withdrawal at all. So where did you live when you first got here? I lived with my sister. Uh, she, uh, they ha my sister and my brother-in-law, they have uh, an apartment in Brooklyn, uh, mm -hmm. 1210 Perry Street, okay. in the northeast, not far from here. Yeah. And uh, I lived with her while I was going to school. And um, while I was doing that, I, I got a little part-time job. <laughs> From McDonald's at mm -hmm. and Columbia Road. Okay. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was, I was, I was a high-paid McDonald's worker. Oh, okay. At two sixty-five an hour. Whoa. At two sixty-five an hour. That was uh seventy-nine. That what year did you come to DC? Uh, eighty-one. I'm not. I'm sorry, not eighty-one. 80, 78 okay 78 265 and I was high paid <laughs> um, but then they gave me uh, that's what was my starting pay then they gave me three dollars because I became the uh, the stock person oh, okay. when the truck comes in with the load uh -huh. I had to rotate the stock and all that mm -hmm. and set it up and all that so the guy gave me a 35 cents oh. increase and I was like Big mm -hmm. money. How much was your rent? I mean, you I, had three dollars an hour. I was not paying rent. <laughs> I was not paying rent. Man, this was just a side kick. Yeah, I, yeah. I had no obligation. Yeah, wow. my, my 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 sister and brother-in-law they took care of everything, food, everything. Yeah, well, that means I'm sure somebody somewhere doing that job had to pay bills somewhere, you know, for three bucks an hour. Uh, yes, I guess so. Wow. But for in my situation, I did that because. Uh, they asked me to, well, you got to get something to do to occupy your time yeah, and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. So, And then, that was only short-lived, though. I did, <laughs> this for, I did this for four months. Oh, okay. uh, it was, uh, I started sometime in uh, September month. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the snow started coming down in <laughs> December, 
man, I couldn't take that call. I said, forget McDonald's, man. Yeah. So I decided I'm going to quit. Uh, and I quit. So what was your first experience with snow like? I mean, did you make a snowman? I didn't make a snow. Snow angel? <laughs> no. Snowball fight? I just was uh, kind of, uh, you know, I laid back. I just looked at it. I was like, is that what snow is all about? <laughs> I was like, you know. I wasn't really thrilled in no kind of way, but yeah. uh, I was like, that's not, <laughs> it's just like uh, another thing that uh, in, my, in my lifetime that I never had, and when I had it, I said, wow, mm -hmm. it was bacon. <laughs> and I, I've never eaten bacon all my life until I moved here. And then when they showed me what bacon looked like, I said, is that bacon? <laughs> all this fat? I said, that's what people die for, bacon. <laughs> Bacon and eggs. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so when I saw the snow, I was not really, <laughs> I was not really thrilled, really. But yeah. I just, I just had to deal with it. Yeah, then, yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, my the tenderness of my age. Um, I didn't have things in perspective. Put it that mm -hmm. way. Uh, yeah. Because I was kind of a rebellious to my dad at one point. Mm -hmm. And at one point, uh, we couldn't see eye to eye at all. And I think I was just ready to leave home. Mm. When I left, it was abruptly. So I guess in my head, I didn't make the transition mm -hmm. properly. That's mm -hmm. it. So, um, were you, were you, when you got here, I mean, were you looking, were you interested in doing any type of growing, or were you just focused on school? I was focused on school, and um, my brother-in-law, he had the plot, uh, one of the plots at Miami Daily, mm. and um, I think it was uh, late 80s maybe. He had gotten a, a job with the government of Grenada as, a, as the ambassador. Mm. So um, apparently he had his hands tied up full. So he asked me to tend the garden for him. Mm. And I did, and uh, he, after a while he he really didn't have time to come back, so he asked me to just take it over. So the late 80s you started? Um, yeah, it was 88 or 89, I think mm -hmm. it was. Yeah, I'm not quite sure on the, on the year now, but it's got to be 88 or 89. Mm -hmm. So what, what did you think of maybe D. Lee when he, when he got there? I'm <laughs> sure it was kind of just some small scale type of thing. It was small you, scale, and it had that old traditional um, kind of a mentality about it because the people who were in charge of the garden, um, you could tell that they came from the south mm -hmm. and they brought all the traditions with them. Mm -hmm. And um, they were very strict about maintaining that garden. Mm -hmm. And um, I just uh, really would, just did what I had to do and, and say hi to those mm -hmm. guys and keep it moving. I didn't. Because it was not my garden officially yet. Mm -hmm. I was just, they knew that I was just holding, holding on to the garden for Antoine. Mm -hmm. That's my brother-in-law's name. Yeah. And then after a while, they keep on asking, is he coming back? Is mm -hmm. he coming? And then eventually I had to break the news. I say, okay, well, you just pay the dues and it's all yours. Yeah. So that's what I did. Well, I mean, you, you probably did a pretty good job on it. I mean, yes, I kept it up to date. It was... Immaculate, really. Yeah, I mean, um, if it's anything like yours now. Sure. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I believe agriculture is in my blood mm. because from my dad's upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing I could do about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's part of the DNA now. Mm -hmm. So, no matter what I do, wherever I do, wherever I go, where, whatever I grow. To me, I want to see uh, the best of it. I want to grow the best. I want to plant the best. I, w I want it to be uniform. I want it to be just looking just great. Mm -hmm. Because um, to me when you do that, in my opinion, it proves that uh, this person has some sort of uh, ethics about him, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, basically that's what it is. Yeah. And it's a good show. You know, people will be wowing and all that about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. That's the way I am. It's, it's something in my culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you when you got to maybe D. Lee, um, what what was the situation? I mean, where 
were you doing or well, what did your brother in law did he have just one plot or was he doing a large one plot twenty five yeah. by twenty five plot. Okay. Was that is that back by where you are now or is that No, it's up by uh, where Bob's garden is, mm-hmm. right across from Bob the um okay. assistant manager. Mm-hmm. Directly across from him. Alright. Um and so were there a lot of other gardeners <coughs> that only had one plot or were there a lot of people doing a lot of um, when I just got on board, uh, it was limited to one plot because there were so many gardeners. Okay. There were a lot of gardeners then. And then, um, for some reason, the, the older heads started dying out. Mm-hmm. You know, and after that, once they started dying out, the, the people lost interest. Mm-hmm. A lot of people just gave up. And. Um, over the years, well, we, we change our management every two years, I think it is. And every time a new manager comes on board, he uh, somehow his way of operating the garden is so different that it drives people away, I think. Hmm. Not, no consistency? No, yeah. no, not at all. So after a while, with the passing of a lot of older guys, uh, the plots remain empty. And then weeds will grow mm-hmm. real, real, real tall. So um, it took several, but well, I say about five years, and the garden really got out of hand because there were not enough people to tend to the garden. Mm-hmm. So that's when uh, I had asked one of the managers, I don't know his name right now, I don't know who it is right now, mm-hmm. if I can cultivate the uh, vacant plots because just to keep the weeds down. Mm-hmm. And he said, Yeah. So that's when I moved to the back where I am and I, I, the reason why I moved there I was looking for drainage because mm-hmm. the middle of the garden the water was set mm-hmm. and uh, heavy rain you would be in trouble so uh, I thought the end part would be more manageable drain that water out so I, when, I, when I got it there was a previous gardener that had abandoned it because he had a lot of rocks mm-hmm. and I don't know why he really I, I don't think he could have managed the garden properly because the water was, was was settling there too. But I knew if I took that garden, I could manage the water and everything and, uh, and build the soil up. And um, that garden should be the right garden. And the shade that comes right there, you know, plants will need like say, let's say eight hours of sunlight, per, mm-hmm. you know, and then a little shade is just right. Mm-hmm. So I looked it over and I said, this is my garden. How did you, what did you do to manage the water? Well, what I did, um, I, I raised my bed, my, I raised the soil, I made beds. Mm. And between the beds, every so often, in, every interval, I will um, put a ditch, or like a drain, mm. and send it down slope. And, um, but the raising of the bed is key, because um, the water will, drain out but you also have to put traps so the water doesn't flow all the way out so you make the drains and then you make a little stoppage like a little trap kind of. so when the water gets there the nutrients will sink hmm. and the water actual water will flow out yeah yeah so. how wide are your beds uh if there is um i have a <laughs> one area that's about uh five feet wide that's the front bed, but uh, the average bed should be about three feet wide. Mm-hmm. You don't want it narrower than that because uh, if it's narrow, then the soil um, erodes easier, well, easily. Because when you have it narrow, the plant will be here, and there is not enough space on the side to hold the soil. So if you make a three foot bed, you can't plant. For example, beans, you can plant three rows of bean, beans mm-hmm. and still space the beans about uh, eight inches apart. And uh, with that kind of a bed, you have, um, the, the plants will thrive better, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, based on what I saw my dad did too, you yeah. see, I, I'm copying from my dad. Mm-hmm. A lot of things my dad did not explain. But visual contact, hmm. I, I watched them and I watched them. Wow. And, uh, yeah. 
So what uh what what was it like in terms of you know we talked about the growing season there and I mean when you come to DC you know mixing some snow and you know whatever other seasons um, I mean how did how did that how did you just view you know the difference I mean what was this was it something nice because you got to grow like maybe different varieties of stuff or there anything that you really wished you could have grown here that you right right yes that's true um, growing in this area Washington D.C. Um, uh, you have to be selective what you do put in the ground because uh, uh, the growing season here is so short mm -hmm. uh, we have what uh, April through September right just about and um even though you could put things in the ground in April, the ground is still cold, so there are certain tropical plants you really they would not survive. Mm -hmm. um, so I would have liked to grow a lot of tropical plants, but for some reason we can't do it. Like what are some of the things you would grow here? Just uh, you know, uh, it's a herb plant that I love growing a lot, and it's a good plant. It's uh, the Cuban oregano. Mm. Beautiful plant. It has a great aroma, mm -hmm. and it has medicinal um, effects about it. And um, it's also a good garnish for mixed drinks and all that. Mm. You know, I don't know if you know it. I, I don't think I'm familiar. I'll show it to you one day. But it's a very good plant. But it it, it cannot tolerate cold weather. Mm -hmm. the, the the moment that the weather dips on the fifty, it's gone. Do you ever try like, like hoop houses or any of that well, kind of stuff? Well, I'm going to take that on because, you know, I'm tired of losing my precious plants. Mm -hmm. So, in the back of my house right here, mm -hmm. I'll show it to you in a minute, I will build a hoop house. Okay. And I'll store my plants. Because, see, yeah, I have energy here. I have the electrical wiring. I could put one out there. Mm -hmm. And I have in my mind a special way I'm going to build it. I'm going to put the plywood about two feet from the ground on a two feet and then I'll encompass that with uh, either mulch or horse manure. Mm. The reason for the horse manure it gives out it emits the uh, the, the, the uh, heat yeah. um, by ammonia so uh, it gives out the heat so that will warm up the outside of the hoop and um, on the inside when, it, when the temperature drops very low I could uh, turn on my oscillating heater fan mm. and that will warm up the inside but it wouldn't take a lot of energy because the outside the base is warm yeah. somehow yeah. somewhat and um, and then the rays of the Sun coming through the cover mm -hmm. so I have that basic idea but I'll be putting it up very soon yeah so sounds like a good plan yeah and that way I can save my precious but I'm tired of losing all my peppers and mm. all those plants that can't survive yeah um so when you were at Amy Manny D. Lee I talked to Benny and Eddie and they were saying that they used, you guys used to have times you'd hang out a lot under the <laughs> oak tree or something yeah like, what, what do you remember about that uh it was a tree uh, well, we will do. We will do. We'll come to the garden and get all, all the work done. Mm -hmm. uh, we usually get there. Well, I, I get there in the evening on a Saturday. That's when I'll have time to go there. And um, most times, the other guys, because they're retired, they might be there all day. Mm -hmm. So when I get there, they will be already relaxing under that big tree. And that big tree somehow uh, it has some sort of a relaxation about it. You sit there, and then you get no work done. <laughs> and I don't, I never could understand what what happens. <laughs> but the, but you must get your work done if you do. If you do not, and you sit there, even though you just arrive and you sit there, you will be there. <laughs> BSing with those guys. <laughs> Show up full of energy. Yes. And just take it from you. Yeah. Yes, and then and then they'll have all the good drinks with them, you know. Yeah. They'll have, they'll have the uh, moonshine. <laughs> some guys will come with some um, um, apricots soaked in, in the moonshine, mm. and man, good stuff. 
Yeah, good thing. Yeah. Walking distance. Yeah. <laughs> and they got so many stories to tell, and and then you know they flirted with people passing by or everything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you lose your momentum very easily. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, somehow the tree died. Uh, I don't know what killed the tree, mm. but um, after that um, we we had no place to sit. But that tree is where you will find out everything and anything of the garden. When I just got there, when I had just started, they told me that chickens used to roam that garden. You know, mm. I don't know if any of the other guys told you that. Um, I think. So I've heard that. Yeah. I don't know if it was. It might have just. I might have talked to you about it. Before. Yeah, Benny told me that. Yeah. So Benny knew about it. Just wild chickens yeah. from the neighborhood. Or well, apparently at one point, you know, chickens. People used to raise chickens here in the sixties. Hmm. It, it was not uh, any problem. I don't think there was any law. Yeah. So apparently, someone in the neighborhood had chickens, mm. and and somehow these are like. Uh, Offsprings that went wild, and they stayed in the woods. Stayed alive. Okay. Yeah, but somehow they must have a warm area to uh, to nest, and, and then they know when to come out, and when not to come out. They must hibernate. Wow. I don't know. City chickens. Yeah, but they had them. So, uh, what other types of I mean animals are out here? Maybe do you leave? How did you How did you prevent you know pests and stuff before the fence? Uh, well, the rodents, um, we had no control of it. The only, the only way we could control the rodents is to set traps or, or some of the guys might um, put bait, you know, poison bait. Mm -hmm. But other than that, um, the rodents, we had no control. Well, the jet population was not that big yet, you know. Uh, we, we didn't, there were no deer around at one point. I think it was uh, in the late 90s, or maybe early 2000, we start seeing deer roaming that area. Mm. And I believe it's, uh, they must have tr um, moved the deer from one area to the next, the park service. I, I don't know how it's done, but there were no deer there. Mm. So we grew crops, and we had no problem with any kind of a deer eating, eating our crops. Except we have the regular um, bugs that we eat, mm -hmm. but that's about that. So what do you what do you do about the the insects? I mean, do you have we um, well, I don't believe in I don't believe in um, chemical um, applications at all. Mm -hmm. So the the the, the most um, raw form of um, pesticide I will use is like seven dust seven. Seven dust. Mm -hmm. S E V I N. It's a. Uh, you heard of eight? <laughs> no, I haven't heard of nine either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a dust. It's a powder. Uh -huh. And um, it's a white powder. Mm -hmm. And it's been, my dad used it all these years. Mm -hmm. It's a very. Uh, it's almost inert. It doesn't. It's not a poison per se. Because you could use it two or three days prior to harvest. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how it's made. I can't tell you how it's made, but yeah. we've been using it you know, on our crops. And I think what it does, it, um, it coats the leaf of the crop, and when, the, like, say, the caterpillars try to eat, they, they will ingest this thing, and it will block up their, um, mm. their food pathways and something. I don't know exactly what happens to this, but it deters them from... Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we use that, and um, interplanting, like, say, you have... Um, Eggplant, you put peppers with it. You you combine peppers, eggplants, and garlic and stuff like that. If you interplant that, somehow it repels. Like but hot peppers. Any kind of pepper, any any pepper. Some something about the leaf of the pepper emits some kind of a, a odor. Peppers, eggplant, garlic. Uh huh. Hmm. And tomatoes. So they all can be planted uh, close by, and each plant protects the other hmm. because they give it a certain type of uh, uh, gas or emission, something they give out and the bugs don't like them. And I guess a combination of those gases, you know, like say the eggplant gas and the onions and the garlic, 
-hmm. And the tomatoes, if all that combines together, oh man, we don't like this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they might like the tomato by itself or the cabbage by itself, but when you do plant the other plants close by, it causes to it cause um, some sort of repellent. Are there any more uh, examples or types of uh, like pairing that you do? Yeah, you could do flowers. The flowers are like the um, the um, marigold. Mm -hmm. uh, they are repellent plants, mm. and there are a lot of other things. Um, like say the ladybug, the ladybug. That's a, a, a insect that will feed on like aphids and other small micro mm -hmm. insects. But other than that. I believe, truthfully, if you feed your soil properly and you put organic matter in your soil and you do not repeat the same plants in the same spot, season after season, that will uh, reduce the uh, infectious mm -hmm. bugs and maybe funguses and stuff like that. But you must maintain good soil. Talk about soil. What do you? How do you? How do you improve your soil? What do you do? I um. Well, first of all, um, I have not tilled my soil with a tiller for well over. Uh, I say about five, five, five. I say eight years to be on the safe side. Mm -hmm. I, I everything is done by hand and uh, with a fork or a rake, or just hand tools. And I use um, compost. I use manure. I use um, I use the organic Espoma plant food. It's mm -hmm. uh, an established plant food. I don't know if you know Espoma. I'm not familiar. Yeah, it's organic. It's a uh, reputable uh, organic food. Mm -hmm. They make the fish bone meal. They make uh, kelp meal. They make dry blood. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's, it's uh, reputable and it's very expensive too. And you can buy that at uh, any other stores here. I will use that to, um, because it enhances growth. The, the, the compost and the um, manure is good food for the soil because it put all the micronutrients and the bacteria and all that there. But if you want your plants to thrive better, you might use some of the Espoma it's recommended. Mm. It's, it's nothing harsh about it. It's real organic food. What about, uh, you taught me that about burying my weeds. Which, which oh, weeds are yeah. the best to bury? Well, the soft weeds. Um, and, but you can't let them seed. You have to um, up, up, unearth them before seed or flowers. And uh, any soft weed except the crabgrass. Mm -hmm. Don't bury crabgrass because <laughs> that's what it likes. <laughs> it likes a grave. <laughs> crabgrass likes dirt. So any any soft weed from um, I don't know the names of the weed. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with the names, but there is a weed called poke weed. But I'm not sure that's the real name for it. But it, it's a weed that always is, is like indigenous to this garden. Mm. And um, just about any soft weed, just uh, unearth it before um, flowering. And uh, you could uh, just uh, take a little ditch mm -hmm. and cover it with soil. Or you don't even have to do that. You could just make a compost pile. It breaks down, or you could turn it. Um, it, it dies and then you could just make a pile and, um, and the next season you could add it back to your soil so talk about you, you have your own special private compost <laughs> pile back there with, yeah. with, with brown gold <laughs> what, what do you I mean is there anything special or do you just throw <laughs> stuff in there and let well, it happen how well, do you do it well it's my my trash in other words my trash I'm trying to turn to gold Mm -hmm. Because all the compost, all the um, all the, um, the the plant matter that's in there belongs came from my garden, and um, when it breaks down, um, I think it's gonna be wonderful stuff. 
How long has it taken to break down? It has broken down. But, okay. Um, I'm not ready to use it yet. Uh, I think uh, I might use it as some sort of a uh, uh, showcase, you know. Mm. When, when once I harvest it, maybe I could uh, uh, I could bring it to some sort of a uh, you know yeah. marketplace and show off my little gold. Wow, wow. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, it's it's good stuff in there. It's all plant matter from my garden. Does it? I mean, does it look or feel or smell different? Well, when it's uh, breaking down, you can smell the fermentation. You can mm. smell that. Uh, I don't know if it's the alcohol from the plant. I don't know what it is, but there's some fermentation going on. Mm. And if you sit there long enough, you might even get drunk. You might even <laughs> get a buzz, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. What about the? I mean, you. You by far have one of the the most weed free gardens. I mean, what I've, I see, you know, you put down the plastic in some areas, and I mean, how what's what's your whole approach? Why does your garden have so few weeds? Um, well, the plastic. Uh, talking about the plastic, the plastic was just uh, a cover to prevent the um, to to keep the ground warm from the snow. That was last year. Did mm-hmm. that. I don't like the plastic too much because uh, the plastic, what it does, it kills the microorganisms. Mm. Uh, somehow the air cannot, the the the, earth, the, the soil cannot breathe, mm. and the, the the earth get real hard, and uh, no moisture for the organism. So uh, it kills them. And that's not beneficial at all. Mm. I just put it on because last season I decided I'm not going to get into all this weeding and stuff. You know. I was doing a little shortcut method, but it's <laughs> it's not the right thing to do. But the way I control my weeds, um, you have to knock the weeds out at the early stage. You uh, when when there is about two or three leaves to the weeds, or uh, very small, maybe less than two inches high, mm-hmm. you get your special rake and you rake it over. So what special rake? What? Well, I have a potato rake, a long prong rake. Mm-hmm. It's about maybe six inches long, maybe a little longer. Curved rake like that. They call it a potato rake. Okay. And you just claw that soil back and forth. Uh huh. But your soil has to be loose to do that. You yeah. can't do it with compact soil. Uh huh. And once you do that, you claw the whole area. It turns the, 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 the soil up and upside down and it, it loosens the roots of the small weeds and then when the sun beats it down mm-hmm. that's a dead plant right there so if you do that on a regular basis let's say every two weeks you have control over those weeds mm-hmm. and by that time the plant will establish itself and um, smother the weeds from growing and you're, you're doing that I mean how many you how many plots do you ha- do you maintain with that method? I mean, because it's 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 more than just one. I mean, it's obviously you do a good job. I mean, you're just doing it mostly by yourself, right? Yes. So I mean, what do you have? How many? Uh, I was told <laughs> I don't know the question. <laughs> I'm paying for four plots. Okay. That's what I was told to pay for. Okay. I believe it's less. Really? But I'm <laughs> I'm not in any position. To <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's less because the motion and the dimensions you see it's not a, a square yeah. area mm-hmm. it has uh, points to angles and all that but I was told it's four plots and um, I'm not going to argue it uh, I think certain areas in the city that you grow community gardens is three and four times what we pay for one plot Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to cry over that. And not even maybe a third of the size. Maybe well, that's exactly right. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah. So so you have about, I mean, you're basically, they estimate you have about 100 by 100. 100 square. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, well, it's the way I have it set up, uh, I don't have a problem working that, 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 that garden because the way it's set up it makes it uh, make it easy to work. And um, that potato rake is my favorite tool because if you plant spacing the plants 
at a, at a fair, uh, a good distance, it's very easy to uh, to go through the rows and uh, and knock those weeds down because um, once the plant establishes itself, the weeds are minimal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know. So I'm, is that what you meant by the way you set it up? Is the key is the spacing? The spacing, mm -hmm. because. Um, you have to have room, you have to have enough room for the plant to grow and also enough room to um, you know to maintain mm -hmm. the growth and the, uh, and and to deliver stuff to the soil like say deliver um, the size of the rake so it goes between the rows deliver the, the food so it could be dispersed properly and all that mm -hmm. and to me it's just uh, like I said it's just a matter of uh, uh, it's an ethical way of growing, and and by spacing, you, you know, you know, you get maximum yield by if you apply the right spacing. So, even though um, I've seen a lot of people put many plants within you know a short space, but if you put the same one plant and you space it properly, you get a better yield than the same cluster. We explain why. Uh, it's like in anything else on this planet survival for the fittest there is a limited amount of food to go around for 10 plants one plant using the same amount of food will um, will thrive better mm -hmm. and uh, will produce just as much mm -hmm. because it, all the nutrients in that space belong to him or her or that plant while uh, ten plants have to share, mm -hmm. so some might survive, some might be choked out. Mm -hmm. So, what are some of the the bigger mistakes that you see, you know, new gardeners making? Um, Besides spacing, I guess is one of them. Spacing is one. Yeah. Um, what should I say? I believe. Uh, one big mistake, I, I don't think they understand um, some of the gardening techniques. Uh, and I think it's all experimental. Mm. They come with some information, but I don't think they could apply it on, on, on a practical level, you know. Um, certain plants need to be separated. You cannot put all plants together mm. because some will crowd out the other and and then uh, some plants uh, they, 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 they grow on a separate level in other words they different different soil um, they, dif they, they use different soil type mm. they might use a finer soil a coarser soil a more clay soil a more sandy soil mm. and I don't think a lot of the gardeners, the new gardeners coming in, have a handle in that yet, mm. until they've been shown how to do it. Mm -hmm. But other than that, um, they all try, I have to say, um, but to upkeep the garden is a big problem. Mm -hmm. They they get all excited in the spring, mm -hmm. and then then when it, the weeds start taking over, it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. Other than that, uh, I think they're really eager to, to grow, but to maintain the plot is a, is a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so is there, what else, what else um, can you tell me about uh, maybe D. Lee, I mean, just, you know, from maybe the, the er, from progression from the earlier days until now, I mean, ha, have, have you noticed, I mean, what has been some of the changes you've noticed? I know the NFI is here now. Yeah. That's one thing. Yes. Um, well, NFI has bring some good life to the garden in terms of uh, populating the garden. We've had more gardeners now than um, since, what, 1990 or so. We had we have a lot of gardeners now. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing, I think, is, uh, I think because NFI is involved in that project. I don't know what. Yeah, they do some lot of marketing, market. networking, and okay. stuff. Yeah. Okay, okay, and with the new, um, I guess, uh, with the technology at hand and all that, and people just anxious to just grow garden, mm -hmm. and you know the word is out there. We we even have a waiting list, as a matter of mm -hmm. fact, they told me, 
<laughs> so um, uh, that's a good change for Mamadi. And um, I just pray and hope that we could get great management to take that to handle this garden because it's such a great garden and um, we could be one of the exemplary gardens for the city. Mm. The location is great, we have access to water, mm. the plots are big and um, I think the, the NFI and the new people that are coming in, they, they show that uh, they really want to get on on the ball and get this garden up and running again. Mm -hmm. So uh, from from the eighties to now, uh, there was a, a a low area. I think it was in the mid nineties. There was a low area for this garden plot um, project because it went downhill. It all, we almost lost it because mm -hmm. there was no um, there were no gardeners available to do it. Nobody wanted to do it then, back then. It so was not. It was not an interest then. So tell us what was what was going to happen. I mean, you're going to. How did you almost? Move? Well, if you don't maintain the garden in terms of uh, keeping the weeds down, and um, you, you don't necessarily have to grow anything, but you have to maintain the growth of the weeds and the grass and. Um, and this was like a wild field, like a meadow, out of out of hand. And the park service, um, uh, I guess they were trying to take it away because uh, we want the, the, they saw no sign of um, interest there. Mm -hmm. And the school, maybe the school, I think they were going to um, try to get it to make up a parking lot for the school. Mm -hmm. They need parking. But um, somehow um, we were saved by one manager who came on board. Uh, uh, what five years ago maybe his name is Hal Stone mm -hmm. and I think through him and the park service they worked at the deal and uh, the garden was saved so um, is that that's when you started is that when you you started acquiring more plots or did, were you no. doing multiple plots well getting back to the multiple plots at one point I had about 10 plots. Ten plots. I used to grow about 10 plots. Mm. It's still it's still doing all the by hand weeding? Uh, well, no. Um, back then, I, I, I used to use the tiller mm -hmm. because I would, uh, I would grow stuff like corn, cover crops. Mm. I, would, I had an area where I would grow specialty crop, but then the area that um, they asked me to just grow stuff, I'll just cover it with corn mm -hmm. or whatever easy to grow stuff okay and uh, keep the weeds down uh, where the uh, compost pile is uh -huh. I used to go where my garden is the compost pile and a portion of NFI garden wow all the way down no not all the way down where Aisha's garden is okay I stopped right there I used to grow all that in the back and still, and I had access to that other plot, Antoine's plot. I didn't give it up yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I controlled a lot of that space for a minute. Yeah. Because there were very few people there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, um, that was that common for, I mean. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whoever wanted to do it, but um, most guys just concentrate on the one plot because that's all they wanted to do. They want to go hang out at the tree. <laughs> <laughs> it's either that or they thought it was too uh, too much work. Yeah. 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 But you know, as much as people think it's a lot of work, in my head it's no work at all. Mm -hmm. Gardening is my passion. Mm -hmm. I could spend the whole day in the garden and it doesn't bother me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. I just had a question I forgot I was going to say. Uh, what? So, have you been to any of the other community gardens? Or? I have been to the garden up on Blair Road, mm -hmm. uh, not too far from our garden. Mm -hmm. I've been to that one. I've been to one in Glover Park on 42nd Street. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know it. I haven't been to that one. No. Yeah, I've been to. Uh, I've been to a few over the years, but not just to visit because I I, I love uh, looking at a garden. Mm -hmm. And a well groomed garden yeah. turns me on. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, really did. So I, I was going to ask you, I mean, when you had 10 plots and I mean, even now with four plots, I mean, what do you what do you do with all the food? I, I mean, you're not that big of a guy that can <laughs> eat 10 plots worth of food. You know what, <laughs> Josh? The loving is in the giving. Mm-hmm. And I grow it just to give it away. Mm-hmm. And I've acquired a lot of food and friends too. <laughs> Hey man, they got mm-hmm. to too. Yeah. And just taking them to see what I do. Mm-hmm. Sparks a relationship. Yeah. Because it, it's a, this man, I move him around. You know what he's doing. That's right, he can feed me. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's all I do is to go out and give it away. Cool. Mm-hmm. That's all I will do. Because uh, first of all, uh, we, we, we can't have to sell the produce from the garden hmm. because it's federal property. Really? Yeah. Whoa, I didn't so, know that. Yeah, so uh, that clause is in there somewhere. Wow. You'll find it in the time. Yeah, we're not supposed to. Yeah. And um, so that's why I give it away. And I love giving it away. Do you, I mean, is it mostly to, like, do you give it any, to in, any organizations or just mostly to just individuals or families? Well, in, in, in the past, whoever passes by the garden, uh, just people, just anybody coming through the path, going mm-hmm. into the subway, I have some stuff available, I give it to them friends, family, gardeners, because mm-hmm. some of the gardeners prefer getting my stuff than to use their stuff. <laughs> Stuff looks nice, man. I can't. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, that's so right. I can just quit my job and just follow you around, and we'll just <laughs> that's right. Hand 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 exactly hand. right. Exactly uh, right. I, I don't mind. You should run to me, it's, there, it's, man. it's a great thing. It's a great feeling. Yeah. Um, yeah. Next year, I'll be taking uh, a year off from work, mm-hmm. and I'll be uh, concentrating on my new project mm-hmm. and this project. Mm-hmm. At Mimi Dealey. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna use this this Mamadi, um community garden mm-hmm. as a platform. Uh, I could use it as a, a, a stage, a set, a, a, in other words, as a what do you call this? As an individual showpiece, like. Mm-hmm. So if I could make this garden a perfect garden, which I think I can next year, mm-hmm. I could use that to branch off into my new project. Yeah, because I have I could show my experiences and how long I've been doing it, mm-hmm. and I have people who could um, vouch for for me. Do you want to Do you want to tell folks any any uh, any hints about what what the new project is, or is that going to be for to to be announced later? Well, I could just give you a, uh, just a basic idea of what I'm about to do. But um, I'm waiting for the um, actual launch date mm-hmm. to make that announcement. But um, basically, it's uh, a 35-acre uh, piece of land up in um, Carroll County, Maryland. Mm-hmm. Carroll County, which is close to Westminster. It's an hour and a half drive from Washington. Mm-hmm. And I was offered this land by a good person that I know to grow anything I want mm-hmm. and uh, with no strings attached and um, that land has access to uh, uh, a natural creek mm. and a spring coming up from the from the dirt from the from the earth and it has sort of a s- rolling kind of a slope so it's not all flat the certain part of it is flat but the majority of it is sort of a slopey mm-hmm. And it's sort of a, a kind of a slow con, convex. This is convex. This is concave. Mm. Convex. I think. So, okay. <laughs> so um, it's ideal for what I want to do. Mm. I mean, I have twice as much as my D Lee Garden yeah. to work with. I mean, the area that's cleared. Mm-hmm. The, the the entire. Um, Plot is thirty five, but some of it is wooded. Mm-hmm. But the area that is cleared is twice as much as maybe they leave. Yeah. The whole garden, but oh. the garden. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I will need equipment, and I need uh, supplies and all that, and and labor. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's what that's all I could say about it now. That's yeah. that's my dream. It's 
I hope to uh, attend to it full time next year. Awesome. Yeah, and it's going to be all organic. Yeah. So, uh, um, I mean, we kind of talked about it already. I mean, what what would you say? I mean, what's your your advice to all, all the new folks that that, that want to get started in gardening? I mean, just uh, um, first of all, show interest, right? Uh, I think uh, if you're interested in gardening, somehow you will come around and uh, you will ask questions to people who've been doing it before, mm-hmm. and. Um, an interested person will succeed because they're curious. Mm-hmm. So my advice to the new gardeners is, if you're not sure of uh, anything at all, whether how to till, how to uh, prepare your soil, w- what to plant and how to plant it, just ask someone in the community garden. After all, it's named community <laughs> garden, so mm-hmm. we should be more vocal and more um, talkative about what's going on mm-hmm. in the garden so I believe that's that's the key to it just ask or go to the people in charge and say well look I have this problem or I want to do this thing that way is this the right way you know just talk about it mm-hmm. mm. and you'll find out that their curiosity will be satisfied because I, I learned by just looking at my dad mm-hmm. doing it most of the time I'm he he was not a guy who was vocal about things. You look at what he did and you, you learn that way. You know? yeah. That's the way we did it way back then. Mm-hmm. So um, I think people of this, in this time, they, they, uh, they're more fast track and I don't think they have the patience to look and learn anymore. They want stuff, you know, spelled out or something like that. So a little bit of a fast food culture? Yeah, way. something like that. So, so, but, you know, just ask and just, um, I think we should have more interaction with, with the gardeners, you know, we should have like say every two weeks or so, have some come together and we talk about different things that we uh, need to address, you know, like um, I'm planting this stuff, you know, and it's not growing that way, you have any suggestions? We should have more interaction yeah. as, a, as a community garden. Information sharing. Information yeah. sharing. Mm-hmm. And we should have like little visits to each other's uh, garden. Hmm. Maybe we could talk about stuff. But um, right now, it's only the NFI that has that going on. Mm-hmm. The other garden, the other part of the garden is isolated from there. Yeah. Everybody comes in with their idea and as to what, it, what it, they think is right, but I don't know. Yeah. I was offered a, a position in the garden just recently mm-hmm. uh, because elections coming up. I think for next season, mm-hmm. and um, Benny had offered me the uh, vice president position. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm in a position to take it on because uh, I have all I'll be doing is just um, gardening for the next year. My project. So, so this this is the official announcement here. You're going to run for. Well, um, he offered it to me. There is no one uh, running for it, so I told him I'll. I'll take the position, All right. but we have to have elections. Mm-hmm. So I don't know the outcome of that until, yeah. yeah. Well, I think you'd be a pretty good candidate, man. Well, thank you. Well, <laughs> it could be, it could be a, a, a campaign issue here because you are telling me that so you can vote for me. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe I'm going to run against you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I think there are many positions available, so you should check with Benny if you want to be on board. Yeah, look into it. Check into it. Because the, the, the uh, president's position is available and vice president's mm. position. Because B is up for re-election. Okay. And I think he said that Bob, he doesn't really have time to do it. Mm. I don't know how to fix all that stuff that Bob knows how to fix. He's, he does a good job. Yeah. Well, he doesn't have time for the um, president position. Uh, 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 Maybe he'll keep that same yeah. position. I don't know, but uh, yeah, that's what's happening there. Yeah. So, what are your what are some of your top dishes that you make? I mean, you gave me that. What's the name of that pepper you gave me? I mean, I would cook that with everything. <laughs> well, that's a pimento pepper. But it's a certain type of pimento, right? Yes, it's um, it is uh, a family of the Scotch bonnet. 
but uh, some scientists um, have uh, went in there and isolated the genes for the hotness of the pepper. Mm -hmm. But the flavor remains, but yeah. the, the hotness is out. Yeah. So um, for, for people who love, or for pepper lovers who don't like it too hot, that's mm -hmm. the ideal pepper. Yeah. Because it just flavors the food beautifully. And uh, you don't get that burning sensation. It was great. Man. Yeah, but um, stuff like that I would love to grow year round. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you need tropical climate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I mean, so so what else is there? What else do you want to tell folks? I mean, this is a uh, this is your platform here. Is there anything I missed? You know, didn't ask you about, or you know, any hidden stories down there? <laughs> no, uh, you covered it all just about. But um, uh. If I may say that uh, gardening, in my opinion, uh, not everybody likes it, but to me it's one of the best ways of uh, uh, staying focused, of uh, beating stress. Uh, um, simplicity is real simple. It makes your life so, uh, I guess, uh, worthwhile, you know. It's, it's a humble thing. Mm. And uh, working with the soil and just Watching things grow is just a natural phenomenon. I, I like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm I'm so proud of uh, President Obama's wife, Michelle Obama, opening the floodgates, showing people that look, we got to grow stuff. Mm. We got to do it ourselves because we can't trust the large companies. Mm. They're infecting our food. Too much stuff in the food. So. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that she came on board and opened up the, the floodgate for everybody to jump on it now. And uh, maybe, who knows, one day I will, I, will, I will become so prominent, maybe she might come see my farm one day. I think, I think you're, you're, you're doing a good enough job of that right now, man. You, 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 would, uh, you would definitely be a shining... Uh, a shining example. So, um, <laughs> okay, well, uh, that that would be my dream. Mm -hmm. If Michelle could come to my farm, up and running farm, mm -hmm. the, the one I'm take up, take on in Frederick. Yeah, she could come and make pay a visit. Mm -hmm. That would be it. You know, she's married. Right? Well, no, that's fine. Uh, he has nothing to do with. <laughs> I just want her present. I just want the yeah, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> a little stamp of approval. Yeah, and so on. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, cool, man. I mean, sounds. I mean, you definitely know what you're doing. I, well, you see, like I said, Josh, it's in the blood. Mm -hmm. It's something that I can't get rid of. And um, I think the, the the stage, though, the age we're living in, is the right time. Mm -hmm. At one time, yeah, you go in a garden, fine. Yeah. But now, if you go in a garden, I think you you've been looked upon as somebody important. Mm -hmm. Again, at maybe a long time ago, way back in the biblical age, whatever it was, mm -hmm. a farmer was a very important man. Yeah. Then all of a sudden he fell, and then now he's rising again. Wow. So, um, I, I, you know, one thing I know, you have to eat. Mm -hmm. And if you know how to uh, plant and grow your stuff the right way, because the body needs nutrition, good nutrition. And if you could provide that, I think the community would love you. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and you could feed the community. You could feed the village, eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I believe it's a good thing in life because you're doing a good deed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, man, this, is, this has been great. Um, well, thank you, Josh. Yeah. Really enjoyed uh, this. I, I tried to uh, say the best way I can, unscripted, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a passion, and uh, I don't mind talking about it any time. Right. Well, uh, we just want to thank. I guess we could wrap it up here. I mean, unless there's anything uh, else you want. Well, that will settle for now. Or we could always follow up. On yeah. Anything that I missed. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so we just want to thank Abel again for you know participating. Thank everyone that's listening. Thank the DC Humanities Council and the Neighborhood Farm Initiative.